Um, we've had reports of Malaysian contract workers who have been treated virtually as slaves, and that's not an unusual story in other parts of the world and in other countries. In South America, I, I've been involved in campaigns involving factory, factory closures in which workers were not given their back pay, let alone severance pay or other things that were obligated to them um, as a result under the laws of their own country and under the codes of conduct of the brands that were subcontracting the firms. In Africa, we see uh, mine disasters right quite regularly. We see problems with conflict minerals. So these stories are happening all the time. But I don't want to neglect the advanced democratic world. US, Britain, and other, part, other democracies um, have been reintroducing sweatshops and generally mistreating migrant workers. Problems, certainly the sweatshop problem, we thought we had resolved by the 1950s. And yet it's been reintroduced again. So this is a universal problem. Now, most recently, and even in the last several weeks, and I know Orit's going to have something to say about this, new forms of collaboration are beginning to emerge among workers, organizations, unions, but other representatives of workers. Their representatives, NGOs, governments, the brands, corporations. And the brands, of course, are very involved in this, including several founders of the world, funders of the World Justice Project, I noticed on the funders list. The brands have also been the source of some of the problem. They created a new form of global supply chain. There have always been global supply chains, but they created a new form of global supply chain, which is very intensify is intensifying the use of subcontractors, subcontracted factories, subcontracted labor. So even though they've been very involved in trying to solve the problem, as we'll hear from Sherry, they've also been involved in creating the problem. So the major focus of this panel is really to assess recent approaches and actual efforts and attempts to ensure that workers have the rights that are promised to them by the ILO, the International Labor Organization, conventions, and often by their own countries in labor laws and in other things, and under codes of conduct that the brands have signed on to, that are presumably providing benefits and protections. And yet we see that they aren't. So we really want to address how to deal with those problems, to think about what works and what doesn't, and what we can do to change that. So I want to introduce the panelists. And then, as I said, each of us will take about 10 minutes to present our own shtick. And luckily, we're distributed um, in, in the various sectors, as the World Justice Project likes to call it. So I'm an academic, as is Katie. But we've also both been involved with various NGOs um, in our country, the US. Um, Katie, is, Katie Kwan. Um, is also part of the Workers' Rights Consortium, as well as an academic at the University of California. Sherry Flies uh, comes from Costco and is part of the corporate social responsibility team there and looking very carefully at supply chains and making sure that they work well, the global supply chains. Varak U, um, I have to remember, is the president of the Cambodian Center for Human Rights. And I met him two years ago, as did Anne, at a session that she was running. And he had an idea then, which I noticed uh, in the article that just came out in The Garden, Guardian, that you've now implemented. So one of the big issues uh, that we'll hear about is trying to find out where brands actually are subcontracting and how to hold them accountable. And perhaps he'll talk about the interactive maps he's helped create create that allow us to begin to understand who's doing what, where, more. Arette Van Heerden, to my far left here, um, used to work for the ILO and still does some work with the ILO, but has for um, a long time been the president of the Fair Labor Association, which is based in the US, though he is based in Switzerland. And in fact, every time I'm in contact with him, he's in some other important part of the world trying to solve some of these problems. You're South African by background, right? 
and was very involved in the South African independence movement. So we have a very great group of panelists here, I think, to start to address these issues. Okay, I'm gonna start. So this is, who's, that, who's timing us? There's somebody down there gonna help with the timing? Great. Okay, uh, yeah, you probably sit there you. so we can see you. So this begins my 10 minutes, okay? <laughs> and so keep me to it. And then help me keep everybody else to it. <laughs> okay, the, my concerns really have to do with the fact that the laws are on the books, but they're not implemented. This isn't a question of, of creating the laws, it's a question of making the laws actually do the work they're supposed to do. Then we can find out how good the laws are. If they're not implemented, we don't even know. But in almost every country in the world, there are laws protecting labor rights. And there are laws ensuring that buildings are up to code. But they don't, as we see, get enforced. Um, and those laws don't differ very much. When you look at the laws, they're all copying each other. They're quite similar to each other. Um, and many democratic countries also have rules that they also haven't enforced and laws that say that they won't accept products into the country that have been produced under conditions in which labor has been mistreated in some way or another. Um, very few countries have used those laws. So even though the laws look similar, the implementation, however, has varied extremely widely in terms of upholding labor rights. Just take a look at the rule of law index on labor rights, and I'll just give you a couple of examples. Cambodia is not great, could be better, but Bangladesh is a lot worse. They're close to each other, right, uh, geographically, very different, even though there could be improvement in in Cambodia as well. The United Kingdom, the USA, are actually pretty low, particularly within their sphere of high-income countries and democracies in terms of labor rights. They're both well below the average for high-income countries. The Netherlands, where we are, is very low. We heard the minister yesterday talking about labor rights but it's not something that's much respected anymore in the Netherlands, even though this was a country that once had very good labor rights. The problem really is aligning rights and interests. Getting corporations and governments to perceive it as in their interest to protect the rights of workers. It's clearly in the interest of most workers to see that their rights are protected but how do we get governments and corporations to have the incentives to do that? When in fact the incentives are generally operating the other way. Low wages and weak regulatory regimes tend to attract business rather than discourage it, though there are certain conditions under which rule of law does improve um, the, the willingness of a particular corporation to be in a country, and I'll come back to that. Unless a democracy exists or other mechanisms of accountability exist, um, there's very little reason for a government to really enforce the rules because they're really much more worried about winning an election and getting the support of the elite, the rich, the, the, the owners of the factories on their side. And even where they're democracies, as we know, that's not always the most effective means either. Now, we do know some things that don't work very well. Um, Justice Kennedy this morning talked about how the will and the power of the people is important to inform the law. But these is, are cases where the workers have no power. In worst cases, the labor organizers are, and even the whistleblowers are murdered or imprisoned, or in the best case scenarios, just lose their jobs and their livelihood. The will of the workers is there, but their will and their rights are largely ignored. And that, that includes my country, not just Bangladesh or Cambodia or the Dominican Republic. We also know that there are real limits to private govern governance. I'm sorry that Richard Locke, who's now the dean of the Watson School, couldn't be here. 
Um, but his book is very useful on this and documents what's gone in, in a number of corporations, including Hewlett Packard, a funder of this conference, um, Nike, and other corporations about the limits. There's some very good things that corporations have tried to do in, in order to improve the capacity of their subcontractors and ensure that they try to meet codes, but largely it's been a failure or has not been anywhere close to as successful as those firms and brands had hoped it would be. There are also real limits to government, as we know. Corruption is clearly a big problem, um, at, at least for many regulatory officials. And as I said already, um, governments are often more eager to attract business or win contributions from businesses, local businesses, almost no matter what the human cost is to that. The unions can't do much because they're very weak or threatened in many of these cases, as are the workers. On the more positive side, because I don't only want to emphasize the negative here, there have been corporate and government actors um, who have tried to do some very positive things. Corporations and governments are heterogeneous. They're not just one person or one kind of person. Um, they're people within the firms, sometimes in the corporate social responsibility group, but not, all, not only them, and certainly people within uh, governments who care intensely about these issues. I'm on an Apple advisory board to try to help improve some of its conditions. Thank you. She's letting me know I have five minutes. Um, trying to improve some of the conditions in the factories to which it's been subcontracting. And one of the things that happened when the Foxconn scandals erupted was that there were people within Apple who said, God, we didn't know that that was happening in our supply chain. This is awful. So they started putting pressure on their own corporation as well. So it's not just the corporate social responsibility people. And in the government, it's not just the labor ministries um, that are doing this. There are others. And we have to start finding them, attracting them, uh, coordinating with them. Of course, there are NGOs, churches, and other aspects, other actors and, um, and groups within local so civil society who play a very important role here. And I know you'll talk some about that. Um, they're often a repository for complaints. Workers can't utter their complaints to their bosses, else they'll get fired. They don't have unions, so they need some place to go where they can tell, provide information about what's going on. I know the WRC relies a lot on that kind of channel. Um, their source of information for the NGOs that are trying, and the international community, and the campaigners who are trying to do something. There have also been some international organizations, like the ILO with its Better Works Project, which has a mixed record at best, but is still better than nothing. And I think it's part of the reason, though hardly the only reason, why Cambodia looks better than Bangladesh. The major thing that seems to work is getting to the reputational concerns of both corporations and governments. We know that campaigns sometimes work. They embarrass the brands. There's a reason why Gap was the focus at one point. Nike's been the focus. Apple is the focus. They're hardly the only players in the game. They're wholly, hardly the only brand engaged in the same problematic practices. But you focus on a leader in the industry. You embarrass them. And you begin to create pressure inter internally to the industry as well to bring the others in line. We've seen incredible success with Fair Labor Coffee for example, and here the Netherlands is a leader. Um, we've seen success in getting Nike, Adidas, and other brands to provide funds for workers um, who've been harmed by illegal closures. We've now seen the development, though how much of it is um, rhetoric and how much of it is action still needs to be said, but certainly a consortium of some of the big brands who've been operating in Bangladesh to uphold their own codes and the legal standards of the country. We also know that um, FDI sometimes work, foreign direct investment. Lena Mosley's work here suggests that companies that are willing to invest um, also begin to put pressure and to really directly invest 
will, might also be willing to begin to put pressure on governments to level the playing field so they're not just the only ones paying decent wages or providing decent factories, but actually requiring the government to enforce the laws on others. But campaigns that depend on consumers and often well publicized and unacceptable events such as the Rana Plaza, which precipitates action in consumers. But consumers are, and publics are often fickle. We're often too dependent on students, which is a generational wave. Right now we have a great group of students um, engaged in anti-sweatshop and other such campaigns. 10 years from now, it could be different. Too many consumers, this is the Robert Reich problem, too many consumers are more concerned about low price than the higher standards incorporated in a higher price. We often have two minds. We see a sale and we want to grab the good rather than thinking about what are the good embodied in that product. Campaigns also depend on information and disclosures. And as I've said, that's often inadequately provided both by the brands and in other ways. My time is up and I'm going to take one more second. Um, so what's the long term? What can we do in the long term? We must keep up the pressure the campaigns, the monitoring. As I noted at the beginning, the eradication of sweatshops was a battle won in the US and is now a battle that has to be fought again. The creation of unions was a battle won in the US and now has to be fought again. Even places like Wisconsin are falling by the wayside. We need organizations that represent workers' interests to maintain, that represent workers and their interests and are committed to maintaining the rule of law. We need capacity building in firms down the supply chain, something we'll get back to. But the real answer, and here I'm going to sound like the old social democrat that I am, and I'm emphasizing both old and social democrat, <laughs> is effective government that serves the general, not particular, good. That means state building and democratization. That means accountable, responsive governments. And that's where our real task lies. Thank you. I'm going to turn to Sherry next. Oh, so good afternoon. Just quickly, like who's in the audience here? Like who's in business in the audience? Who's in government? NGOs? Civil society? I guess we, we all are. See, <laughs> I wish we all would have raised our hands, right? Yeah. Uh, first, I just want to clarify one thing that Margaret said. Um, I am not in CSR. We don't oh, have. Sorry. That's all right. Um, we don't have a CSR department, um, and quite frankly, I don't think CSR should be corporate social responsibility anymore. Quite frankly, it's corporate survival and resiliency. It's really what it is. And this, this, these, these topics and things that we're talking about are really um, a prerequisite for business to stay in business. And that's because we have limited resources on this planet, and that's kind of how we approach it. And I was trying to think today, how would I bring forth all that we've been doing as a company and what I personally also believe um, uh, is where I feel why we haven't made progress as fast as we should and why we can ha continue to have the same problems, the same issues going on and on. And, you know, obviously you're all committed to wanting to speak and do things for the good of those who can't speak on their own behalf. I mean, we all care about that, but what do... But what are we doing? And I'm starting to think that things are improving. I see it. I travel the world a lot. And there's starting to be a shift. But is it enough? Is it fast enough? Is it deep enough? Is it going to stay? Is it sustainable? And how do we go faster? How do we go deeper? We're running out of time. The time for talk is over. It's time for doing. And we're here talking again. Um, and it sometimes gets frustrating because you can have phenomenal conferences and you can have phenomenal speakers and you can have, get all jazzed up. It's like going away to some spiritual retreat and you're all jazzed and you're all zen in one and then in two weeks later you're back in the chaos. And um, which kind of got me to a poem I want to start with. It's one of my favorite poems. It reminds me why it's important that we do and think harder and it's by Mary Oliver, and it's called What I Have Learned So Far. So I'm going to open with a poem. 
Meditation is old and honorable, so why should I not sit every morning of my life on the hillside looking into the shining world? Because properly attended to, delight as well as havoc is suggestion. Can one be passionate about the just, the ideal, the sublime, and the holy, and yet commit to no labor in its cause? I don't think so. All summations have a beginning. All effort and effect has a story. All kindness begins with a sown seed. Thought buds toward radiance. The gospel of light is the crossroads of indolence or action. People, be ignited or be gone. And now, that's the end of that. But while I understand the importance of these good programs that people have talked about that protect workers and enforcing labor laws, um, I also believe it's only at the beginning. And I believe it's the beginning of what business can do and should do and is doing. And we're just, that, that's just the beginning stages. We are a global consumer society, regardless if you like it or not. That's what we are. And that is a phenomenal entree point and through business to really make these differences. The market is the entry point. The market can be the solution and a leverage point, portal, whatever you'd like, but to make, pro, to make more improvements and to move it and shift things further and faster and deeper. And I believe in benevolent capitalism. That is not an oxymoron. And I'm starting to see a lot of it emerge, work in progress as it evolves, we're evolving, and is seeing more and more about it. Now, Costco, we've had a code of conduct since 1999. We wrote that, as a matter of fact, I wrote that. I used to be general legal or corporate counsel. And uh, I did that after going to Vietnam and seeing the conditions of a lot of workers in the rather southern part of the country. And I went over there as an act of compliance, but it turned into being an act of compassion. And that's why I started with a poem and started with the one big shifting I think we need to do is we have to look inside each of us. Every one of these institutions, everything that all of us are doing are people-based. There's not the brands, the corporation, the governments. These are people that are formed in a common value system within something within they work. And they work and they shift when people inside realize that this is not how I want to live and this is not how I want to make my legacy and make my life. And when we start going to the core matter of people and how people work and why they work, that's when things change. And while in Vietnam, we were there saying, look, it, we're going to, our code requires you to comply with the laws of the country where the products are being produced. We don't have some international standard that we deal with. We go straight to those laws, like Margaret says. They're there. No one's just enforcing them. They have become a specification for our company. You must comply with your own laws. And the guy says, hey, you mean I have to be international to do business with you? I have to comply with my own laws? It's like, yep. Well, they're pretty tough. Yep. You know, and so then all of a sudden that ends up becoming how we deal with and how business and the market can do it by just going and meeting people where they are and taking it forward. But the bigger opportunity that I really want to get to is value chain analysis. It's not supply chain, it's value chain. Value chain means everybody in the chain provides value, or they better get out, which Costco tries to get out in inefficiencies. But everyone provides value and they are deserved to be treated as valuable. That's why it's a value chain, not a supply chain. And then you make sure that everyone gets a fair return. And that goes all the way to the source and to the workers. And we go to on the ground and we go to the source and that's my job. My job is going and meeting the farmers and taking it from whatever the product is, may it be minerals to um, agricultural products and follow it all the way to the consumer. See where the efficiencies are, see where the inefficiencies are, make sure everyone gets a fair return along the way. And we are doing that in our most successful programs or when we are co-creating with the people on the ground and their value systems, not me as some American coming over there and saying, oh, here's what you should do. It's going and working with the tribal, tribal elders of what works in those communities. It's definitely working with women. Women must be at the table. They must have a voice. And it's collaborative. That's the new thing. It's got to be collaborative between everybody and the stakeholders. We work with NGOs, with governments, with civil society. It takes longer. It's harder work with academia as well. 
And all of us together have a different perspective that we co-create together with the people that this is, we are working with to make it affect with them. We've had community um, income improvement programs. Obviously, you need more um, income. That's an obvious thing. How do you get better yields? How do you pay for premiums? How do you, you teach people so they can get better yields and get um, better premiums? Cooperative training, business training, social programs, lots of schools we're building and health centers with good labor practices that are part of uh, teaching amongst, for example, the cocoa farmers in Ivory Coast and the, the labor practices there, wells, storage areas. Because post-harvest um, problems of crops is where a lot of the money is lost for people. So you kind of look at where do you things fall down? How do you get better economies? How do you treat people better? We, what do you do with total off-grades? So you have total utilization of everything that is processed at the plant, total utilization of the crop, provides more income back into those communities. Leadership training and resiliency. Going back to the essence of who the people want, what do they want to do. We're working with indigenous people, for example, in the Amazon to continue to keep those livelihoods there, their social structures in place, as well as the environment. We are starting to pay conservation fees for it. It's not, no longer is it unilateral extraction. You can just take things and take things from people. People are giving you their treasure. You need to pay back for that. There's a fee for that. It's the true cost of doing business, not just what the market will bear. It's the true cost of goods. And financing and access to credit. Those are just an example of a lot of things that we're doing on the ground by going there. But the reason I brought up at the beginning what I want to end with is that it's all of us as individuals finding our voice, having our courage, because this is hard work, and it's long work, and it takes a lot of passion and time, and so you've got to be congruent with who you are when you do this so that you can do it as you are. And I just feel like we always talk about there's not, and there's no disrespect to what you said, but there's, it's all people. It's not just brands, corporations, governments, da, da, da. It's all of us as people walking this earth and wanting to make a difference and speaking out and doing things for those who don't have the chance to be where we are and here. And I think when we start going and tapping back to that, we'll have the courage so that we will be ignited. Thank you. Katie. Okay, so uh, full disclosure, um, Margaret just told you that I work at UC Berkeley doing labor research, but I also uh, used to be a garment worker, a union organizer, and uh, now am on the boards of the Worker Rights Consortium, which is a um, group that monitors college uh, licensed products in, in uh, several countries, and also the International Labor Rights Fund. Um, so today I'm going to talk a little bit about um, the failure of CSR, why I think it happened, and suggest uh, some things, some areas where the law could help. Um, so the, the Rana Plaza collapse in Bangladesh uh, really illustrates the failure of CSR. After 20 years, in, you know, in its most recent iteration of monitoring brands for their codes of conduct, we see this, the single largest disaster that has taken place um, in the garment industry. And um, it comes on the heels of this. The four worst disasters in the garment industry happened, three of them happened in the past two years, and one happened 100 years ago in the very famous Triangle Shirtwaist Fire. And so you have to ask yourself, has there been progress? If not, why? Um, aside from health and safety, wages are also a big problem. This chart tells us that of the 15 largest exporters to the United States, wages as a percent of a living wage are only a, a minority amount. Only Mexico has, has a, minimum, a, a wage that 
gets up to 67% of a living wage. In every other country, it's 50% or less. This is after 20 years of CSR. Here we have the monthly real wages and how they have uh, changed from 2001 to 2011. Now you'll see some countries, notably China, uh, where uh, the wages have increased a great deal, or some, some. of course, China started from a low base. Uh, and uh, you'll see that there are many countries in the world where wages have actually gone down. So once again, uh, despite 20 years of monitoring, things not only haven't improved, in many ways, they seem to have gone backwards. So I'm going to present three reasons for what I think have to do with why this is the case. One is that the standards themselves are just too low. Uh, so uh, the previous chart showed that um, minimum wages are only a small percent of the living wage. Five minutes, oh my god, okay. Uh, and we have uh, the Bangladesh situation also shows that uh, even though there are health and safety standards, that things that the monitors went in looking for obviously didn't catch uh, the reasons why the building collapsed. The second reason is that existing standards aren't enforced, and Margaret talked a lot about that, so I won't. The third thing, and I think this is you know, a, an important point, is that the the codes of conduct that the brands have adopted are soft law or voluntary. They are not enforceable. Uh, so if a brand does not follow through with its promise to provide safe and healthy working conditions, then the worker has no legal recourse vis-a-vis -vis the brand. Um, if the brand doesn't follow its promise to provide freedom of association for its workers, then the worker has no legal recourse vis-a-vis -vis the brand. So there is a fundamental conflict of interest between corporate profit-taking and workers' rights. And unless the workers are organized, then corporate profit is going to win. Uh, and just to give you a quick example, inside every apparel manufacturing firm, there are people who are the, called the merchandisers, and they're the ones who try to source the garments for as cheaply as they can get it. And so a typical thing that would happen inside an apparel manufacturer would be the person who's sourcing the garments would try to get the lowest price, and then the compliance department would come along and say, hey, you know, that, that's, not gonna, uh, that's not gonna leave any money for the contractor to pay his workers adequately. Um, and uh, so what, you, but what usually happens is that the merchandising department wins and the compliance department loses. And then, okay, so you have this low price, and then the, 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 the contractor says, you know, I can't, I can't possibly meet your standards because the price is so low. And the brand will just say, uh, compliance is the cost that the contractor assumes, take it or leave it. And so, this is how we get the race to the bottom. Very quickly, in the 20th century, Margaret mentioned that we had largely eradicated sweatshops in the United States. Uh, and um, I wanna talk about a legal um, principle that uh, the Garment Workers Union put into place at that time, and it was called the, the notion of joint employers. Uh, employership, and, and, and the theory was that in the garment industry, the brands and the contractors 
we're part of an integrated process of production, IPP. And the, the, the findings were that the contractor is wholly dependent upon the brands for its uh, orders. And so therefore, one could not call the contractor independent. And therefore, um, uh, in US labor law, the National Labor Relations Act, there was a, an exception made for the garment industry. Um, and this, this notion of integrated process of production and joint employership uh, enabled the union to engage in collective bargaining uh, in a three-step process that went first from the union to the brand, secondly, from the union to the contractor, and thirdly, between the contractor and the brand. Um, this allowed the brand to pass wages and wage increases through the contractor to the worker. So the union negotiated a 5% increase and um, the, uh, with the brands, and then uh, they negotiate a 5% increase with the contractors. And the final step would be that the brands would negotiate a 5% increase in price to the contractors. This system enabled there to be basically a win-win-win situation. And garment workers during the 1950s had wages as high as the highest uh, paid workers in the US at the time, steel workers, um, and you know, had a great cultural life, you know, performed on Broadway and, and musicals like Pins and Needles, and, and you know, even Doris Day was the biggest movie star at the time, um, uh, played a garment worker. So I, I just... Um, give this as an example of how creative legal thinking helped enable the workers and their union to figure out solutions, strategies that would um, bring their wages up uh, in, in a basically uh, uh, closed market situation. Uh, I've written about this extensively, and if you go on my website, you can look at this. I don't have time to talk about it anymore. But what I really wanted to say is that now the world looks different. I doubt if one could directly apply that same, same three-step bargaining to the current situation. But it is worth a lot of thought. How, did, how can legal mechanisms be developed globally to regulate capital. Um, how can we make standards enforceable, for example? And there's glimmerings of this with the Bangladesh Accord on uh, Fire and Building Safety, this, um, this new agreement that's being signed in Bangladesh, and uh, I know 60 or 70 brands have signed on to this. So this would make health and safety provisions legally binding upon the brands who sign it. Um, the next question for, for our legal minds here would be how to make enforceable standards universal so that competitors uh, would have all the same costs associated with labor. Um, and in the, in the three-step model that um, I talked about, all of the competitors were formed into employer associations. And these associations um, meant that they all had the same labor costs. Well, you know, I mean, what, what is a similar legal me mechanism that could be found today? Finally, I want to say that uh, it, it, it is important, I think, to think about how in developed countries, uh, there really isn't a need for monitoring of codes and conduct, of, of conduct, and how the rights of citizens are so valued and respected that, uh, you know, they engage in collective bargaining and freedom of association, and so you don't need monitoring. Well, how can we um, 
how can we figure out how to enforce freedom of association and collective bargaining more as a, as a priority in enforcement of existing codes of conduct. So ultimately what we're talking about is the workers themselves, themselves stand up freely and enforce their own either laws or uh, collectively bargained uh, terms of labor. Okay. <laughs> but that was that, a good that point to end on. That was a good point to end on. Greg. Well, um, thank you and a very good afternoon, um, everybody. Um, I'm very pleased to, to be sitting on the same panel uh, with a representative from Costco. Uh, you used to be my hero because Costco was providing a lot of cheap stuff and I, I, was, I used to be the guilty uh, consumer who, who would go for the cheap uh, products uh, and, not, and not looking at the whole uh, value chain as, as the, was the mentioned uh, in, in this uh, discussion. But even, even having said that, I think having now been working in the field of human rights uh, at the most grassroots uh, level, uh, working with, with many affected people, um, it's quite interesting, I, I think, to, to look at, to also keep uh, remembering the consumers I was. Um, and and to, to look to, to strike a balance where I think is a, a sustainable approach to dealing with the with these with issues of um, supply chain uh, and, and responsible um, cooperation, I think that's, that's um, to me is, is, is the the balance which I've I've always tried to um, to, to strike. Um, many once upon a time, or many many years ago, um, the good people within the European Parliament um, come up with a clever idea so to try to help the 20 least developed countries in the world, um, which allowed imports from these countries uh, to the European market uh, without any tax, without any restriction, except for arms. So the initiative is, co is known as Everything But Arm, EBA. The, a sugar company, uh, Tate and Lyle, sorry for the naming and shaming, um, decided that since Cambodia received the, the benefit of being the poorest of the poor, uh, that can supply, that, that qualify for the EBA, Tate and Lyle come up with a business idea, uh, that makes sense, and that is to contract to buy sugar from Cambodia. What a sweet thing, sweet idea. Um, about 10, about two, in 2005, a powerful tycoon, <coughs> synonymous with typhoon, um, powerful in the sense that he is also a senator uh, within the ruling party, illegally received 20,000 hectares of economic land concession. In other words, he received the land granted for free to him by the royal government of Cambodia, my government. There's no 20,000 hectares of land in Cambodia, or in fact, probably anywhere else in the world that doesn't have people who use those land. So it was obvious um, that the, somehow the, the good people in, in the Parliament of Europe uh, pushed Tate and Lyles to contract with a local companies who happened to be very powerful to grab lands from about 2,000 families, more than 2,000 families. Until today, that issue has not been resolved. Many of the effects, affected families, most of the affected families are never compensated fairly. There are still people who's fighting today. And, and so there, there is an initiative um, called the Blood Sugar. Of course, you, you probably heard of the Blood Diamond, uh, the campaign uh, in Sierra Leone. Um, I think the initiative in Cambodia is actually trying to push Tate and Lyles to push 
for these local companies for which it contracted, uh, contracted from to work with the villagers and, uh, and, making, in, and making sure that the villagers' land, their farmlands, are not grabbed. So that's, that's one. And until today, the, the issue hasn't been resolved. Uh, the European Parliament has actually aware, is aware of, of these issues because the Parliament issued a weak resolution in ash, asking the, the people on the ground, which is the European Commission, the European Union Embassy, uh, inside my country to investigate. And this is where we, we are today. Now, my talk today is actually not focusing on the sugar or the blood sugar. Um, but to, I just, because my, my talk is actually going to focus on the garment industry. My organization just recently published online an interactive map that linked big brands um, with people in the brands, of course, uh, to, to the, the factories of which they contract, they, 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 um, that the, the companies, the, the factories inside Cambodia that hire the workers that produce all of the um, shirts, the pants, the shoes, the underwears, the socks um, that most of us wear. These companies, uh, we, we, the, the brands include Gaps, Nike, H&M, uh, you name it. It's actually quite, quite a wide ranging of well-known uh, big brands, big names. We, we found f at least 558 factories that supply the, the garments to the big names. Now, just give you another, another example, another case. Uh, last year in, 2000, in February 2012, a man who happened to be a governor walked out of his car, pulled out a handgun, fire multiple shots into a crowd of protesters. These are government factory workers who are protesting for higher wage. He happened to injure three women, three young women, uh, between the age of 19 and 21. The court in the province for which he was governor dropped the charge, dropped any charges against him. That case was appealed to the appeal court. The appeal court asked the provincial court to rehear the case. And then the court recently opened the case and sentenced the man to one and a half year in prison. It's until today, the man is still a free man. So, so just like you and I, he's, has, he's enjoyed his, his freedom. But if you look at the, the garment industry in Cambodia, there, recently also there's a, there's a major protest in a factory called Sabrina. Sabrina is a Taiwanese-owned factory that supply clothes to Nike. Um, there's a reason, there's a, there's a violence clash between the unionists and the workers with the, the factories end up with uh, some injuries on, on both sides and also probably damage to the factories. Eight unionists are now being held uh, in pre-trial pre detention on charges of, inc of incitement and also destruction of, of property. Now, just some of the, some of the issues or some of the some of the very reasons why most of you guys um, know or heard or, or, or have heard of, of these cases is mainly because it's associated with Nike, Fuma. By the way, the, the, uh, the one, the, the governor who, 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 who injured three women, the, the factories uh, for which they, the, 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 the brands for which they uh, supply is Fuma. And of course, Fuma uh, got upset with my organization for issuing a statement naming Puma as Puma, as the buyer. Um, so it, the, the reasons, the only re main reason, the, the reason why you guys are paying attention to some of these incidents um, and, and the international or the, the world here of any of these incidents is big because mainly because of they associate with international brands. For every single case for which it made to the international media, there must be, there, there are over one or 200 other cases that nobody pay attention to. So the, the issues the, of the government in, industry as well as the, the, the other sectors, including economic language sessions, become a major, major political problems within Cambodia. 
My argument today, and I, since I don't have much time, is that I think there's a, I think when, when the unionists and people like myself, the, the NGOs working on protecting, uh, promoting protection, protecting the rights of workers, uh, pointing all of the fingers to the, na to the known name brands, the question is, are we making an impact? Do we want the company or the buyers to pull out? Do we want the EBA, the, the, the good people in the European Parliament, to cancel the initiative or the, the, economic, the, the everything but arm initiative? And, and the answer, the short answer is no. Because despite all of the problems that I have described, there are some positive movement. And that, that is where I feel that there must be a more concerted effort to work with the buyers, the big, the big brands, in pushing for rule of law in the country. Because beside the brands who are, more, who are responsible, the good governments of my country, the Kingdom of Cambodia, is actually the main culprit. It's corruption that's the main culprit. We can fight all we want with, with the companies. The unions and the companies having clash, physical injuries, I'm, I'm talking about physical clashes. And, and somehow the officials who, took, who, who actually forced the companies to pay bribes, including the factories, to pay them bribes are sitting and get away with this. And my view is, I think the unions and the buyers is in the buyer's interest. It's in the interest of GAPS. It's in the interest of H&M. It's in the interest of um, Puma. To work with the unions to push for my government to reform the judiciary. And I think this is where you guys have a lot of leverage. I think the buyers do have a lot of leverage. But I, I think it starts with stop the blame game, although I, I name and shame oft, uh, sometime. Uh, is, is to stop the complete the, the, the blanket blame games and start to look at what's the root of the problem. So the root of the problems in this case is, is the lack of rule of law, the, the, the high level of corruption. And because of that, everything else crumbles, and that including the collapse recently of two buildings that, that, uh, that a few fatalities and, and injuries. So, so I think this is where I, that's, that's my general uh, position. Um, and I, I still, I'm still very hopeful because in the case of Tate and Lyle, uh, we have managed, despite all the problems, we have managed at least to force the local companies, the tycoon, to negotiate, to talk to the people, although there's no resolution and the, and the provincial court in that province, which is a different province, is under complete control of this tycoon, of this senator. So, so I think Tate, it's in Tate and Lyle's interest to actually push for this tycoon that the only way Tate and Lyle will, con the only way that Tate and Lyle will continue or will uh, start to um, import sugar, the sweeten, uh, the, uh, to, to supply to consumers in Europe and, and in, eventually in the US is for these factories to behave. And I think if Tate and Lyle is doing that, I think we have, we, we, it, it would contribute to our work in pushing for rule of law. I think, that, I think, uh, I think if that is the case, I think we have, uh, we have some hope. And this is why I think raising the, the links, make it transparent and pressuring the buyers to, to disclose the factories for which they source, I think is the start. Thank you. Thank you, Barack. Or it. I'd like to take a systems view of this um, issue, this problem, and have a look at it from two sides, the enforcement side and the business side. If you think of the enforcement side, the governance side, traditionally or um, in theory, what we should have is a global system of regulation of the labor market and the workplace that starts with the ILO which adopts conventions and recommendations by tripartite consensus. Those then are ratified by nation states and enforced through their various enforcement agencies. And at the workplace level, employers and workers should come together to 
arrange, to come to specific arrangements within that framework. And if those break down, you should be able to go to labor tribunals or some form of dispute resolution. That's the model. As a loyal ILO official for many years, I was totally committed to promoting that model. But if you think about it, more and more examples of dysfunctionality or complete absence of regulation are coming to light. And as I lay them all out on my desk, I start to wonder whether it can work, whether it does work, and whether it ever worked. And we could discuss examples where this regulation has broken down, which go from Paris to Phnom Penh to you know, some part in the Philippines. Typically, it's a lack of inspectors, lack of resources, handful of inspectors trying to cover tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of workplaces. It's often a problem of corruption or just a sheer lack of political will on the part of the inspectors or the enforcement agencies. Um, in, if you survey the global labor market and ask yourself how many countries have got a functioning labor relations system where we have well-established, well-organized, representative unions bargaining with employers and arriving at collective agreements to cover their workplaces. Ask yourself how many of these countries have effective labor tribunals. If you were a worker who had had their rights violated and you try to go the legal route, how many years would it take you to get to court and what kind of justice would you get when you got there? So, you know, in, in, in the limited time that we have available, let me just posit as a, as a starting point here that the system of regulation that we developed after 1919 is not working. Um, probably the most flagrant example would be Uzbekistan, where you have cotton as their most important export. It's one of the most important exporters of cotton in the world. Every year, they close the schools, close factories, close public um, service agencies, bust them to the fields, and we have a system of forced child labor to pick the cotton harvest. This goes into the global supply chain. It's been well documented by various international organizations. But since Uzbekistan is a member of those organizations, it has declined the offers of help from the ILO, UNICEF, and other agencies. So those agencies, while seized of the matter, have not been able to act. This now gets us over to the business side because we have companies, socially responsible companies, who are very concerned about their, um, their supply chains. They've set up auditing systems to, and codes of conduct and auditing systems to try and ensure that there's at least some floor of standards installed in those factories. But if the cotton that is, for example, being cut into product at Sabrina is coming from Uzbekistan, all of the good work that the brand might have done in auditing that facility, filling in the gaps left by the labor inspectorate and other government agencies, is undermined. So the dilemma that I want to look at is we've got a governance gap, we've got a breakdown in regulation pretty much around the world, developed countries as much as developing countries. Private actors have tried to step into those governance gaps and deliver the public goods of respect for rights at work and to a certain extent remedies at work, but their influence is limited and their, the extent of their enforcement has been limited. Normally to tier one suppliers, the cut and sew facility or the final manufacturing facility, very seldom have they been able to get down to the lower and lower tiers, and all the way down to the raw materials. So on a supply chain basis or a value chain basis, we have precious little regulation from end to end. But there's a, there's a deeper problem here, and Bangladesh really captures this so tragically. I've just come back from Bangladesh, and the more I looked at Rana Plaza, the more I said to myself, you know, this is the inevitable outcome of our system of consumer-driven, consumption-driven economic growth. We love a good deal. We love cheap product. Um, I can go into Zara and buy jeans for 19 euros. Um, Zara now offer me over a dozen collections a year. 
I don't buy by season, I buy by collections now. I buy stuff I don't need. I buy a new cell phone twice a year. In order to get me to buy that much stuff, it has to be cheap. So the consumer drives the retailer to cut the price, the retailer cuts the price to the brand, the brand cuts the price to the supplier, supplier cuts the price to everybody they're dealing with. Basically, the three main cost factors are rent and utilities. So to, in order to cut the price of rent, they move into worse and worse facilities. Can't really cut the price of electricity. And labor and materials. Normally the materials are specified by the brand, by the buyer, so they can't do much about that. So they squeeze the cost of labor. They hollow out the wages and benefits. They don't pay overtime premiums. So labor cost has in many ways become the adjustment variable for these cost pressures which come down the supply chain. But in, in other respects, you could imagine the supplier cutting the price to the building contractor and the building contractor having to hollow out the service that they're offering. So we get a building that collapses. In Bangladesh, the electricity supply is very unreliable. So most factories are running diesel generators. Um, you've got multi-story buildings, multi with a couple of factories per floor. So you've got generators up on floors which, never, which should, were not designed to support that kind of weight. Um, we've got a system where we've got a zero-sum game notion of value. We're not sharing value, we're extracting value, and everybody's gain is somebody else's loss. And inevitably, it's the weakest actors in that chain who pay that price. So if we were to look at what to do about Rana Plaza right now, we can, we can do extra audits. We, we absolutely have to, thank you. We absolutely have to check on facilities, get out of the facilities that are in imminent danger of collapse. But just take fire safety. Auditors or inspectors who arrive have to go to the main gate. They have to declare themselves. And between the time that they have declared themselves at the gate and the time they reach the factory floor, fire escapes are opened, aisles are cleared, stairwells are freed of any encumbrances. The inspectors get in, they see a place that looks like it could be safe. If they're certifying, they might well certify the facility as safe. When they leave, we go back to business as usual. And especially if we're hitting peak period, you've got a lot more material in there than before. They're running behind schedule, stuff is being stored in stairwells, stuff is lying in aisles, and the doors are shut, are locked shut because of security fears, basically trying to avoid shrinkage or theft. So that facility, late at night, in peak, when, they, when they're rushing to meet an order deadline, is gonna look a whole lot different to the day that the auditors were there. So you cannot inspect in safety. It all comes down to the business practices and the way those people do their jobs. So the only people who could keep a building safe are the workers themselves. They have to have the awareness and the voice to be able to identify problems or risks when they occur and do something about it. But let me come back to the system. Additional audits, probably the minimum legal requirement, if you like, um, for a responsible company. Training workers to make them aware, giving them voice, much more effective long-term um, indigenous response to the problem, bottom-up rather than top-down. But if we're still determined to put more and more collections into Bangladesh and to cut the price every time, where does that pressure go? How do we keep people from hollowing out everything they're doing in order to satisfy our need for consumption? That's the system we have to talk about. Till we can start to do something about that, run applauses are inevitable. Thank you. Okay, we're going to spend about 15 minutes or so talking among ourselves and questioning each other a little bit, if that's okay, and then we'll open it up to all of you for questions. Is anybody dying to ask something? Well, I wanted to follow up on what Oret just said because, I mean, how do you sort of stop that kind of 
consumption. And isn't it also that brands have, in the past 25 years, sort of pushed that? I mean, before, you know, not, not everybody was so keen on wearing, you know, logos of certain brand companies and, and so on. And a number of authors have pointed out that the rise of these brands, you know, is, has a lot to do with the image that they project and so on. And so I just, you know, I mean, where, where's the root cause of that consumerism and how would you, how would you stop it? If, um, can, can I respond to that? Sure. If everybody become Buddhist, true Buddhist, then I think we can maybe, we may be able to stop that. But I think it's more of a moral question than, than a, than a, a practical approach question, I think. Um, because I think recently H&M, uh, who also um, uh, contract uh, or sourced uh, clothes from, clothes from uh, my country, actually make, a, are, is voluntarily publish the factories for which they, they sourced. So in other words, do what we, we have just done, basically putting everybody on, onto a map. Uh, on, onto the internet. Um, but H&M actually voluntarily uh, did this. Um, we, we start pushing them to declare who, who, who they source. Because in, in the past, when, when there's a, a fainting, there's a lot of fainting happening in my country, and, and uh, the government respond by saying because of superstitious belief, that's why those, those women uh, faint, uh, fainted, in the uh, fainted, yes, fainted uh, very often in the, in the factory. So uh, go and burn some more incense, you know, um, pray some more. Um, but but when, when H&M was pushed, um, because because when the factories, when the factories for which they, they sourced, and the, in that factories the workers fainted, and then they fainted again. Immediately, nobody know who the, the buyers are or who is was. Um, so, so when when unions and organizations starting to highlight and say, okay, let's link them. Who who is buying this? Let's try to go to the factories. Or let's try to go to the buyers, and let's put let's get them to work with the factories, push them to work with the factories. Because of 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 course, in in, in the, the case of Cambodia, we cannot depend on the government because the government will not do anything. In fact, the government is the source of the, the, the underlying source of all evils, um, of, of many of the evils, um, not all, but many of the evils. So, so in that case, I think H&M was, was pushed, was cornered, because they have a very high, supposedly very high uh, labor code or, or some sort of internal code. Um, um, you know, for, um, in, uh, so, so in that case, we... We, we managed to, or many organizations and unions in, inside my country managed to push H&M to, de, to publish this. It's, it's a start, but I think it's a wrong, to me it's, 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 a, it's a beginning, but I think we need to help H&M, because if H&M is the only company that published this, H&M will get blamed every single time. It, it will get into inter international media and all of the, seems like all of the fainting happening in H&M factories. And the, the fact is maybe because no, no other factories are, or no other buyers are actually known. There's faintings in, in many other factories that supply to many buyers. But if, if you only know H&M's factories, uh, source factories, then you can only blame H&M. There's not an equal playing field. So I think it's, it's in the interest of good buyers like H&M to support organization and initiatives to push for the transparency in the supply chain. I think that's, that's at least creating an equal uh, playing field. Yeah, I want to get in for a second. I, I think there are two issues here. That, so one is um, the consumers. And there are two informational issues here. One is information about who's producing it and under what conditions. But the other is, which is useful to the NGOs and the, other, and the campaigners. But the other is the kind of information that's actually provided to consumers. I mean, we've had, um, there's some really interesting research going on right now by Michael Hiscox and others, um, looking at uh, when you provide information to consumers about how, whether the products were well sourced or not. Uh, mm -hmm. Keeping aside all the problems you've raised about, you know, who's actually producing the cotton, but that at least um, that the coffee came through this route or the clothes were manufactured in this way, that consumers often, not always, and not every consumer, 
but that they're often, particularly in this environment where there are these campaigns going on, that they're often quite responsive to that information and it affects their buying patterns. Now the other strategy is the Costco strategy, which it doesn't publicize a lot that its products are actually following this process. But in fact, you can go to Costco with some confidence and buy a product there. Um, that's a corporation that's taken it on as its own. But the real issue is the one you raised at the end. How do you get the corporations to begin to put pressure on each other and to put pressure on government? And I think, Anne, we ought to get you into this conversation because you're trying to do it with, around some intellectual property rights issues. There's a consortium of electronic producers that have been trying very hard. Now, they're not totally successful, right? In part because there are a lot of other corporations that aren't so compliant with that. There are the large, smaller contractors who are very hard to get involved. There are the governments that prefer the rents from corruption than the rents from um, doing the right thing. But there are some informational issues that we can actually begin to solve. And the campaign shouldn't just be about naming and shaming. They should also be naming and applauding, right? These are the corporations that they may not have fully succeeded, but they're trying to do the right thing. So you can feel some confidence buying from the Gap or Nike now, but only as a result of long campaigns um, that you may not feel with some other corporations. Give them some apples, you know, some carrots um, to actually continue to do well, as well as, and this doesn't mean we stop slapping them around, because I think we have to do that too. <laughs> You know, I like to take a contrary view. You know, there's a race to the top. It's not always a race to the bottom. We're seeing this a lot in the field, especially in agriculture, where you spend a lot of time um, going out and you know, organizing um, cooperatives and doing all these great programs, and then other people are running in and grabbing them and poaching off of each other to these cooperatives because everybody wants, you know, the most certified or the most things. So there is a race to the top amongst a lot of the uh, people that go to source. I agree with you on your cotton. We do try to go to source on everything. Who cares how great the factory is if what the incoming ingredients are not responsibly sourced in that regard as well. So it, it's a way to um, ensure quality um, as well as uh, so you know the, the actual incoming ingredients are part of your specification as well. I also think I wish I believed you about the race to the top. I really well, wish I believed you. Well, I can tell you it's true. <laughs> I'm seeing it, and, you, and we can talk about it. It's not the number one thing that's happening, but it, what I'm saying is a shift in its beginning. And, there, and that's where I think we have to go on, is that there is now doing that. Two or three years ago, you, I wouldn't have told you that. I will also tell you that when we talk about this, these people that if, have, if consumers had more information, they would buy more. I don't think that's true. I don't think consumers care at most about it. it. It's a lot of them don't. There, it's a small segment. And when you have like certified products and you know, socially responsible products and all these things, that is a niche market. If you think about everybody around the world buying things, there's so few people that have the time or the money or the inf affluence to look or care, or That's can true. choose to say, oh, I'm gonna buy this because it's fair, fair trade certified versus this one. We're talking about this segment. What we have to do is shift the entire systems. And that's where it has to be a cost plus basis, not a market where, based upon where things done, and what are the actual costs of this input? And that's what Costco does. Everything we do is cost plus. It's not what the market will bear, whatever it is. It's our incoming cost of goods, plus our margin added to it. But what we're doing, and it's new, is we're going down all the way to the cotton in Uzbekistan. We, by the way, we won't source from there, but currently. But because you look at what is the cost of the fair labor wage to the, and what is happening on the ground, we'll just use cotton, because I just came back from Bangladesh myself. We can, most of the cotton, by the way, that comes into the US is US cotton. In the Central Valley of Fresno, goes raw, goes over and gets spun, woven, sewn, and shipped back to the U.S., especially the high-end, long staple, extra long staple cotton, which is in your Brooks Brothers and in your Nordstrom and all your high-end shirts. And probably most of the shirts that you guys have on, you probably got 80 double count out what you're wearing. And that's exactly what's coming from the U.S. 
So, but anyway, you go back, and that's what you, people don't know. They don't know where stuff comes from, and people don't care. They just care what it costs. So I think it behooves us, the ones that are providing that, to know where it comes from, and to, because that is what we have to do. To me, the value chain is the, is the answer. And then, when, and then you do the cost of what it is for the cotton and what's fair. Then you put the cost of what it is to transport it, then in the manufacturing plant, and then it being exported, and then at the retailer. But if it's always really expensive at the retail end, then no one's going to buy it. It's only going to be this amount. The consumer also has to get a fair return, and it stays in a niche. Whereas if you do the whole thing, food does not cost enough in the United States and in a lot of the developing world. It is too cheap. It's not fair what it costs. It costs too much other places. The true cost of what things cost are what we're paying for. So I'm into a philosophy of cost plus what does it actually cost and what is fair for what it is. You do that, you're going to shift the entire system. So Sherry, if the cost of labor goes up, would Costco also pay all or part of that additional cost? The cost of labor is determined. Well, how is the cost of labor determined? Well, you know, if the minimum wage in a country goes up. Then we have to pay it. That's the cost. The, uh, the cost to Costco or the cost to the supplier? So you look at a cost plus, and so you ask, what's your label cost? It's a line item costing. Mm -hmm. So we don't say, you have to sell us this product for $19.99. Mm -hmm. It's like, what's your labor cost? What's your fuel cost? What's your transportation cost? So that is going to always change. What's your incoming raw ingredient cost? But Sherry, cost? Costco is fairly unique. And it's also got a particular, talk about a niche market, it's also got a particular niche market. True. There are a couple of corporations that can get away with this, right? right. Apple charges a lot, but it also makes a lot of profit. I'm not sure its value chain is quite the Costco one. But, you know, so how do you solve, how do you get other corporations to do that? Costco's made that decision to do right. that. Because it's made that decision to sell in a particular way mm -hmm. so that it can actually make a profit off of doing that as well. But not, you know, Walmart isn't doing that, Kmart isn't doing that, Target isn't doing that. Not that you're exactly, I mean, you're a higher priced and more middle income. But see, Target is doing that. And as a matter of fact, even Walmart is starting to do that. And this is why. And this is why I think it's eventually get, other people are going to get there. It's because there's a limited resources in this world. This planet is this big. There's only this much water. Water is key. No one's talking about water. Water is the key. There's only so much water, there's only so many minerals, there's only so many trees, there's only so much agricultural land. And there's more and more people. So other people are going to have to figure out how do you get to the ground to get that limited resources. That's all there's left. And so that's what the race is, is to those limited resources. There's only X amount of this, X amount of that. How do you get it? You have to have fidelity in your supply chain so they'll sell to you, not to the next guy. Well, if this, this worker can work here, can work here, he's going to work for it, he's going to get paid more. He's going to, and it's all, it's, that's where it's moving to. Okay, I'm going to let, or do you have anything you want to add to this discussion? And then I think we should open it to the audience for about 10 minutes and let you all get to your next panel. Uh, two things to Thank you. what was just mm -hmm. being said. I talk to a lot of groups of buyers, and they normally tell me, in, particularly afterwards, in confidence, that the, the company's social responsibility position is not consistent with its purchasing practices and that they are not paid to hit those targets. They have other incentives, they have other targets that they have to hit. Um, so there has been a shift within many of the most progressive companies to integrate social responsibility incentives and, or, or goals and um, purchasing. It's tough. But I do see examples where this has worked. Last weekend, I happened to speak to 100 purchasing managers from a very big consumer goods company. And the, the head of sourcing explained that sourcing based on price was a zero-sum game. Didn't want it anymore. He wanted sourcing based on shared value. And working with suppliers to unlock value in the supply chain. We spent a day discussing human rights with those 100 purchasing managers, and at the end of the day, the head of procurement stood up and he said, we used to measure our success by how much money we were able to shave off each order. He said, from now on, we're measuring our success by how many lives we changed. And he took oh. concrete examples of you know, 
How many tea farmers do you source from? How many of this, how many of that? It's a global brand. Um, <laughs> we want them in our countries, so, right? <laughs> now, now this, this might have been for my, for my benefit, but I don't think so. I, you know, we had a lot of follow-up conversations. People were really, um, really concerned about it. And what they said was, look, right now, I wouldn't recognize a human rights abuse if it was staring me in the face. And secondly, I wouldn't know what to do about it. So I'm great that we're shifting our position, but I still need to be trained to understand these issues and to, to know how to react. What I'd like to do now, I know that others on the panel want to get in on some of this, but I want you all to have a chance to ask some questions, and we only really have about 10 or 12 minutes left. Now, do we need microphones for this? OK, so there are a lot of you. Why don't I take five? I'll take six questions. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to count, and then we'll have a chance for some responses to whatever the questions are that we feel we can respond. No comments, quick questions, so lots of people can get in. Um, this woman there, then him, then that woman over there, then him, then him, and that's five, and we got one more, six. Well, thank you for being the first question. I'm Anna, I work at the World Legal Forum here in The Hague. And I have a question because I understand that integrated reporting is something that a lot of businesses are struggling whether they should do it or not. And that's actually about not just connecting people to profit as uh, has been ex explained by uh, uh, Sherry Flies, but also pl planet. And I was wondering what you think about that because I hear a lot of people and profit connected here because obviously it's about labor rights. But what about the planet? Because you explained it's really small and you have these resources okay, that are limited. We got your question. Thank you. <laughs> okay, there was someone over here. My name, <clears throat> my name is Dumisa. I come from Johannesburg. I'm chairman of Balo World. Um, it's information only, really. Um, I think Kate, is it Katie? Katie Kwan? Yeah. Kevin saying we, we. I don't know who we are. If I could just get a sense of what you, you do and where you do it and, and how. And then also information only about Costco. Okay. And the next question was this woman in the white jacket. Hello, my name's uh, Kate Burns from Australia. Uh, my question is more for Katie and Virak. Uh, in terms of the kind of corruption figures there, that Brack, you've identified corruption as one of the, 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 the big problem in Cambodia, and we've seen from your figures, Katie, it's got worse for Cambodian workers there. Uh, given that there's a huge NGO presence with human rights organisations in Cambodia for, and foreign aid, what answers do you see in terms of how to rectify that situation? Ms. him. One of these two, because they both get questions. <laughs> Hi, my name is Mama. Uh, I'm from Burma, and uh, uh, he used to be called Burma, and I'm from Myanmar. Uh, actually, I'm against what you were saying, because I walked with the ILO to get back into Burma for 24 years. So uh, my question to everybody is, why don't we just use the ILO core standards to get things rolling? I think this is where I think we don't need to invent the wheel, but. The co-labor standards given by the ILO is something that helped uh, changes in Burma and help us to get back into Burma. So this is what I, I was, it's a question, and that's all. Okay, the question back there, and then the last question up here. Back there, the man with his hand up. Thank you very much. My name is Yitzhak Alster. I'm an attorney, I'm from, I'm from Israel. My question, maybe out of naivete, I, when I read the title, and when you said about ethical supply chain, the relationship between productive business and labor rights, I thought you might also talk about the question why this is good business. Why does it make good business sense to protect labor rights? And maybe that's the way to do it. And not only talk about how do we enforce it better or how do we regulate it better, but maybe it's a, it makes a be a better business sense. Okay. I don't know if it's naive or not, but... It's a question. <laughs> I'm Budhi Lalamudyumdar from Bangladesh. Uh, uh, 
I don't know whether you are aware that there is a dangerous concentration of economic and political power in Bangladesh. And many of the producers are also lawmakers. And they are the uh, power, they are the real power, sources of power in Bangladesh. So how are you going to enforce whatever agreement you come up with? Because they have the record of defying and doing whatever they want to do. And, uh, and also, I wish there was somebody from Bangladesh uh, in the panel who could give a perspective. We are talking about Rana Plaza and Tarzin factory, and, and there are more to it than has been discussed. I wish there was there. a yes. panelist from Bangladesh. Thank you. Okay, why don't we just go down the line and uh, answer, answer, say whatever you want to say to the questions. Uh, answer the ones you can Can you ask answer. somebody to go first? Ask somebody else to go first. Let me think about it. Okay. Okay. Brock, can you go first? Sure. Um, on the issue of, of um, corruption, as I said, I think the evil in, in the labor, the, the garment industry, uh, as well as other industries, including the, the land grabs, the major the, that's taking place is, is corruption, but also uh, lack of accountability. Uh, in, in fact, um, if you look at the, for example, the recent collapse of the, the building, uh, there's no, nobody uh, was being prosecuted. Um, so because of that, I think there's, there's it will be a, a big, a huge battle. I think uh, in terms of NGO presence and a lot of donors' money and a lot of aid, um, just like the business, I think the, the diplomatic community as well as the aid money uh, tend to be competitive. And that is the, um, most people want to actually give aid where it's most secure and less risk. Um, and so it, it doesn't always go in fighting the real culprits, the real evils in, in all of this. So, so if you look at that, I think if we depend, if, if, if we depend on AIDS to help solve Cambodian problems, I think we're actually going to wait for quite a long time. And, and so where do we start in terms of fighting corruption? So I think building a political culture within Cambodia uh, for which the population themselves understand that fighting corruption is in their own, their own interest, in the interest of their futures and the fu their, their children's, but also is actually f working with businesses. Uh, as, as, as mentioned, uh, that, that actually fighting corruption will probably, uh, at the very least, um, lower, the, lower the, the current fights between unions and, and employers and, and factories. And I think, I think it's in the interest of the unions, it's in the, in the interest of the, of the business uh, to do that, I think. Um, so I think that's, that's where we are. Um, it's, it's a slow, it's a slow um, process, uh, but I'm, I'm positive um, because I think we, we also have an election in two weeks, uh, whereas my, my mind is now at, uh, <laughs> we, we, have a, we have an interesting election with a, a strong opposition. It's not gonna be a, 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 a the opposition will probably not going to win, but at the very least, it it, it gives the ruling party a bit of a, for the, um, a bit of a run and, and creating some nervousness. So hopefully, that will push the government uh, to reform. Um, so I think that's that's where we are we are at. And why don't I why don't I take sure. one of the questions here? Maybe two of them. The question about business. I'm going to try that one. Um, you know, we have a lot of experience where in trying to ensure that businesses understand that it is good business to treat workers fairly, um, that you get greater productivity, greater fidelity. I mean, there's lots of studies that show that, but that's all based on a model of businesses where they're building the businesses, own the businesses, hire the workers, live in a community, stay in that community. And what we've seen, um, with some exceptions, is a very different kind of model of business that's often incorporated in the new way the brands are doing business with loads of subcontractors down the line in whom there's been considerable investment by some of the brands, by some governments, by some international agencies to create training about what good business practices are in the treatment of workers. And that's where Richard Locke's work is really useful and I do recommend that book to you because it's just not working all that well. Because there's too many short-term profits to be gained from operating in a very different way within this supply chain framework 
unless you have certain kinds of commitments, as Costco does, but that's unusual, um, not, not the norm. So I think that's, that's part of the answer to that question. Um, on the corruption question, that's a big question, um, you know, how we finally get governments to take responsibility. But I do think part of that is what several people here have, have emphasized, is by these efforts that many of us have engaged in, helping workers have freedom of association and to organize also creates a voice that is a political voice and a whistleblowing voice, um, as well as ensuring that labor rights are protected. Katie, does that yeah. lead into you? Yeah, it does. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, I just want to say that um, in the short time that we've had here, there hasn't been enough time to cover a lot of things. So um, corruption is a problem. But um, I, for example, do a lot of work in China um, where the situation is different yet again because of the government, because of the government-controlled unions, uh, and so on. And so. So, and we didn't talk about any of that. So corruption, yes, is an issue, and, and so are many other things um, that we didn't get to. Uh, so I would just uh, like to add that in. The second thing I want to say is that um, many companies have adopted sustainable sourcing policies, and um, it seems like th there's been a lot more traction on sustainable sourcing environmentally than there has been yes. on the labor side. And um, I was in a meeting the other day with um, some brands, Nike, H&M, REI, and, and so on. And they were talking about, and you know, they were talking about race, uh, racing to the top and raising the bar and sustainability and everything. And um, you know, in their talk, it. It, it sort of veered more towards the environment, you know, raising the bar environmentally. And so I said, well, you know, what about the labor side? You know, given the slides that I showed you, uh, you know, have you ever raised the, the price to the contractor um, to uh, effect greater compliance? And, you know, they just sort of looked at me like, what, what, what makes you think that there would be a cost that needs to be raised? So I said, there's a cost to compliance, and um, you know, higher labor standards means you're going to have to pay higher prices. Well, you know, they they truly didn't see that, and I thought, whoa, you know, like, are we back to where we started 25 years ago when we tried to, you know, make the case that you know there is there you know, there is responsibility in the supply chain. It just, it didn't seem like it had hit home. Sherry, why don't we go to you, because I, I want to end with Bangladesh, because we had a very interesting conversation that addressed some of your issues at lunch today. So um, why don't you go next and then end with Orit, who then has to rush out to a plane, so we know he will stop on time. All right. <laughs> <laughs> I guess what I would just say is it's good for business to pay people well because then they stick around. And um, we, Costco, have always been attributed to paying our employees very well. And so our employees have always, so we start, you start where you are at home, and we have very low turnover and we have very productive and loyal employees who gives us high quality um, work. We have now expanded that circle of care and philosophy further down the value chain because we know that to be true for ourselves. It's good business when people are cared for and well paid, they, they provide a good product. They farm well, they, they sew well, they do things better, they're not tired, they're not injured. And that's where it is the good business and I think that's just something that we have always known. It was our founder started our company based on that and we just have now continued to find it and it, and it, it comes out. And so for us, it's, it's really it's pretty much embedded um, why, why we do that. The planet is very important because, and that I think you're right, Katie, a lot of people are so focusing on sustainability on the green movement and they forget about the human side. And the human side is obviously um, needs as much work as it can. And I guess just the final thing that I would just close with on the Bangladesh, um, as I said, I was there a week before this collapse. And now everybody wants to cut and run from Bangladesh, don't go there. No one will buy anything made out of Bangladesh. 
This is the time to be in Bangladesh. This is the time when everybody is looking at it to get some models, to get some people, find some people in government, NGOs, business, retail, and together and build a beautiful model from what is there. Let Phoenix rise from those ashes and then use that as a model and others will follow. This is the time to be there. I think Orit might tell us about how some ashes are drowning the phoenix. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm totally with you, but let me just map out the problem. Uh, last week I met government people, parliamentarians, industry leaders, trade unions, grassroots NGOs, uh, brands, and I asked them all to give me some insight into the problem. And one, the, the conversation that really stuck with me was one of the industry leaders said to me, look, we've got about 5,000 structures here. They're all dubious. We've got about 49 factories with certificates of occupancy out of 5,000. And we all bought them. He said to me, I bought my certificate of occupancy. I just paid to make it go away. I didn't want to get involved in the process. So we don't know how sound those structures are. But they're the only structures we have. He says, there are 5,000 companies here. Are we going to shut these 5,000 companies down until we can decide if they're safe? No. There are something like 3 million young women workers. Are we going to send them home until we can make those structures safe? Not going to happen. There are brands lining up to place orders in factories that are already at full capacity and who are just going to subcontract them on. Are they going to go somewhere else? No. So we have a system, we, we've got to face facts. We are dealing with a system that is there, that is functioning. And he said to me, as an industry leader, what do you want me to do? This is the business case. We've seen probably two dozen initiatives announced in the wake of Rana Plaza by international organizations, coalitions, different donor agencies, real danger of overlap and confusion between them, very little coordination between them. But talking to the grassroots NGOs, they said, look, none of that has trickled down so far. We have seen no help. We are helping amputees get to hospital for treatment. We're helping the people who brought them get a meal, find a toilet, sleep somewhere before they take them home. We haven't seen a cent of the aid that has been announced. You see, we also haven't seen the people who announced the aid. They, they were furious. They were literally <coughs> mad about the fact that they haven't seen the people who represent those issues publicly anywhere near the scene of the disaster. So what do we do? This is my appeal to you. What do we do? I'm sitting trying to figure out. I hear this industry leader. We've got a system. It's there. It's functioning. It's part of our global supply chain. But it's not safe. He's telling me that. He's acknowledging that. And we've got a governance gap that's the perfect storm. We've got to somehow create the coalition to fill that gap. And on that very positive note, <laughs> I want to thank everybody here. And I want to remind you that part of this conversation will continue um, tomorrow night. And Kelly, who is sitting here, is running a salon. And I welcome, and she welcomes, all of you to come. Thank you. Thank you.